Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different angle, but I think that it plays with uh, a similar theme that we've been hearing. Um, a lot has been talked about how there was kind of a perfect storm that allowed for this space to really grow rapidly. Uh, you had the quantitative easing, you had the banks stepping away, um, and a lot of things have helped kind of propel this exponential growth. Um, but I'm just going to focus in on, on one specific uh, portion, uh, because uh, in the, uh, to be brief, um, and that is we're really talking about the technology side. Uh, if you look at how modern banks and credit cards are actually being run, it's a lot of green screens still today. And you're looking at technology that really hasn't changed in 30 years. And it's been being built on top of um, all of these legacy systems. And you know, for, for even a lot of my colleagues, they had to learn how to operate these green screens in 2010 in order to be able to do their job, right? And that is really what is creating this big opportunity for the space is because these systems uh, are really collapsing upon themselves. Uh, so just uh, real quick, I want to talk about technical debt because I think it's something that people don't focus on that much, but it is really, really important as platforms have to scale. Uh, the concept of technical debt is it's just like regular debt. Uh, by cutting corners or by not investing in your technology, you're acquiring debt that you have to pay back at a later time. So you might be able to move fast in the short term, but you're, you're taking on long-term risks because you're going to have to pay that de debt. And additionally, it accrues. So the longer that you don't pay that technical debt back, the harder it is to get out of it. And so when we talk about you know, you've had this massive um, consolidation of the banking industry, right? And this is driving a lot of it because they all have different systems and all of a sudden you're smashing them together very rapidly. And then on top of that, you have kind of this chronic underinvestment in technology at banks and credit card companies. And so really what that, that has caused is that green screen that I, I was talking about earlier. It's a complete broken system that literally cannot be fixed. They've acquired so much technical debt that they cannot fix the existing system. It's like, uh, the analogy I like to use is it's, you know, they, it's basically a, a, a patient on life support and the doctors can keep the patient alive, but they can't heal the patient, right? And so all this effort is going into keeping this patient alive but they know that that's the best they'll ever be able to do. And so, you know, I think that this is one of the reasons that we've seen so, you know, so much growth. Um, and so, you know, when we really talk about why is this the moment, right, 30 years of these legacy systems have gone through and why is now that they're finally being disrupted in a large way, uh, the first thing is, is, and we've seen this in other industries with the internet, is as things become more modern and broken down, and I'll talk a little bit later about the value chain, uh, you see this huge effect on the space as the internet comes in and changes both the, the cost of you know, processing as well as the cost of data and basically makes both free. Uh, today at Orchard, it's more expensive for us to throw away our data than it is for us to keep it. That's how cheap storage has now gotten. And so then the other big part, and we, the panel talked a lot about this, is that consumers are changing. The expectations for consumers are radically different today than they used to be 10, 15 years ago. And you see that in a lot of industries. Um, Ron spoke about Uber, right? Anyone who's actually had the Uber experience knows that it is better than the existing transportation networks. The first time that I took an Uber in San Francisco, I was amazed. I was like, this whole city is now opened up to me because I have reliable transportation and it, on the touch of a finger. And from that moment on, I have never taken a cab in San Francisco. Right, and it's just that consumer behavior changes and then it does not shift back, right? The expectations all move. And so really, what is, what is kind of this, this causing? The first one is obviously customer service is changing, right? Being able to service borrowers and investors in real time and be able to have those feedback loops that they expect 
Also, you know, with the, the data sets getting so cheap, you can actually do massive queries, which used to cost, even a couple years ago, you would have to go buy a $2 million software license to be able to run these queries. And now you can run them on Amazon for a fraction of the cost, right? So not only can you collect the data, but you can actually analyze it. And then the other piece is you can actually scale your companies, right? When we think about really what Airbnb and Uber is, is they have the ability to connect these two sides in a way that is incredibly operationally efficient uh, versus the existing models before. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my experience. Um, so this is when I noticed Lending Club. You know, I have a background um, in advertising technology, uh, and I was uh, with a company called AdMel that had been acquired by Google, and I found Lending Club in the early days. And the first thing that I noticed when I started digging into the data was how consistent that exponential growth curve was, which if anybody has been around marketplaces, exponential growth is pretty rare. Exponential growth on a consistent basis is even rarer. And so I knew that they were on to something at that moment. I didn't understand the forces at the time that was actually powering this. You know, now we've talked a lot about them that are, that are creating this opportunity. Uh, but this was a big piece of it. And this is Lending Club today. And my belief is that that previous slide that I showed is going to be Lending Club today as we look out over the next couple years, right? The thing about exponential growth is no one sees it coming because most of the growth happens at that last couple months. And so in order to be able to see it coming is very difficult. Is it? I also want to talk about another really amazing thing, and that is as these platforms have scaled, they have actually gotten better at underwriting. Think about that for a second. Exponential growth, 8% month over month, and you're actually getting better with each vintage on being able to underwrite them. And so this is really showing that, that this is a scalable system that is being built. And the thing is, you don't just see it on Lending Club. Prosper's vintage curves are even better over time. They've been able to improve default rates. And this is amazing, right? It's as they're getting bigger, they're getting even better at underwriting. And so this is a really important piece of, of the space because if this wasn't true, we would be growing into the bads and the story would have a bad ending. So uh, obviously we, we have to talk a little bit about the Lending Club IPO uh, because I, I think that in a similar way that the Facebook IPO was that moment in time which people actually took social serious. And I think that the Lending Club IPO is similar, is that everyone has been ignoring this space. You know, I talk a lot with the biggest banks. They're looking to be educated on this space. And the biggest thing that they always say is, oh, it's small. I don't have to worry about you. You're a rounding error, right? I don't care if it's growing that fast. But I think that the Lending Club IPO is actually forcing the big players in the space to actually take a harder look at it and say, why is this company being valued in the way they are? Why are they growing so fast? Why can I not actually predict what their valuation is going to be on any of the models that I currently have? Why are they unique? And so I think that this is going to be a big watershed moment for the space. The other thing that's happening too is, and you see this as well, is an ecosystem has been growing up around this space. And I wish we could put all the logos on this. It's not even close. We hear about at least two or three new companies a week right now. And so you're seeing different players within the ecosystem start to specialize um, and be able to scale up their operations to be able to take on you know, the larger and larger uh, pieces that are coming in. And so you have the institutional investors, you have the retail investors, you have credit scoring, you have custodians. You know, Ron talked about this as well. You have all different types of originators. Um, and these are global originators. I mean, I think the one thing that people don't realize is that this is definitely a global shift and not one that's based in any one country. You can look in Asia, you can look in Europe, you can look in the US, you can look in Latin America, South America. There's activity going in every single location as there's new platforms being launched. So this is really important. The other piece as well that we don't talk about is on the marketing side. 
Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, borrower acquisition costs are going to be really important long term. You know, a lot of people look at this space in a similar way to kind of the E-trades, where that was the, the number that defined the success of companies was how much did it cost for them to acquire um, that customer over the long term. And so uh, it's a great sign that we're seeing a lot more marketing companies come in here that are able to continue to get better and better. So this is the other uh, really important piece is that we're seeing this value chain start to be put together. And we're also seeing specialization within this value chain, which is really important. And people are now experimenting with new models in each of them. And so I just talked about the borrower acquisition. You know, we're seeing the risk pricing and fraud protection. There's a lot of new companies that are trying to automate that of identity verification, making it cheaper, easier, faster. Uh, servicing, you know, I think that there's a lot of work being done in order to be able to do it at scale. You know, uh, for, for a lot of uh, origination platforms and other spaces, they actually outsource the servicing. And I think one of the things that uh, is promising out ours is almost all the platforms do their own servicing. And as they grow, they're getting more efficient with how they do that. And then distribution and payments. These are things that we're all figuring out today. What's the best way to distribute loans to investors? What are the rules? What are the types of auctions, right? How do the payment flows work? These are, this, this is really the challenges of, of the space today. And then we're seeing, you know, on, on Orchard side, right, we're seeing not only are investors bringing third-party credit models to, to help them select loans, but we're seeing third-party modelers come and say, I don't want to be a hedge fund. I don't want to be an institutional investor, but I think that my way of ranking risk is really powerful. And so I want to license that to investors who can use that at scale. And then again, you know, I, we, as Peter said, the secondary market is going to be a huge focus of the space next year. So just to kind of bring this full circle, I, even though we're actually growing exponentially and the space is really exciting and finally became, becoming an asset class that is being taken seriously by Wall Street, the story is not that you know, people who haven't entered the space have missed the boat. You know, we're still in the very, very early days when you look at the percentage market shares that these platforms have. And so on top of that, we haven't even seen scaled platforms in every asset class. And so over time, I think that we'll be able to see these new players take a majority share in each of the asset classes. This is not going to happen in the next 24 months. But I think that this is a, a pretty sure bet that over the next five to 10 years, the new players will displace the existing ones because of their operational efficiencies, because their ability to predict risk better, because of their distribution to capital markets in a more efficient way. And so with that, um, I'll leave you. And uh, it's exciting times in the space. And I, I hope everybody uh, gets involved.